Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the channel. If you're new to this channel and you enjoy listening to horror stories, click subscribe down below to stay up to date with all of my uploads. Also, before we get started, please leave a like on tonight's video. Thank you. As I sat at my desk, staring at the computer screen, I couldn't help but feel like an outsider. The fluorescent lights above me seemed to be mocking me, reminding me that I didn't belong here. I had been working at this corporate job for years, climbing the ladder and achieving success, but it all felt hollow. I was living the life that society deemed as successful, but deep down, I felt like I was missing something. One day, I couldn't take it anymore. I walked into my boss's office and handed in my resignation. Shocked and disappointed, my boss tried to convince me to stay, but I had made up my mind. I needed to break free from this routine and find my true purpose. Without a plan in mind, I packed my bags and bought a one-way ticket to Brazil. It was a place I'd always dreamed of visiting, with its vibrant culture and beautiful landscapes. As I arrived in Rio de Janeiro, a sense of freedom washed over me. I was no longer tied down by a job or societal expectations. I was free to explore and discover who I truly was. I spent months traveling through Brazil, immersing myself in the local culture and meeting new people. I hiked through the Amazon, danced at carnivals, and learned to surf on the beaches of Florinopolis. For the first time in my life, I felt like I belonged. I was accepted for who I was, not for the job I held or the money I made. But. As my money began to run out, I knew that my journey in Brazil was coming to an end. I returned home to the UK, to my small apartment in Southampton. But this time, I didn't have a job waiting for me. I would spent all my savings on my travels, and I didn't want to go back to the corporate world. I struggled to find a job that aligned with my new profound sense of self. I didn't want to go back to the rat race and lose myself again, but as the bills piled up, I knew that I needed to find a solution. That's when I stumbled upon an advertisement for a piece of land with a small building on it. This building looked like a shed. It wasn't much, but it was my chance to start over. With the little money I had left, I purchased the land and moved into the shed, paying just under £80,000. It was a humble and simple existence, but it felt more authentic than any job I had ever had. I spent my days tending to the land, gradually cleaning things up, growing my own food, and exploring the surrounding countryside. I felt connected to nature and myself, in a way that I had never experienced before. I no longer felt like an outsider. I felt like I belonged. But, as the seasons changed and the cold winter months approached, I realised that my shed was not enough to sustain me. I needed a warmer shelter. That's when I came up with the idea to build a tiny home on my land. With the help of some friends and my own determination, and a lot of waiting for planning permission, I built a beautiful and eco-friendly tiny home. As I settled into my new home, I reflected on my journey. I had gone from feeling like an outsider in the corporate world, to finding my true home on a piece of land, many miles from where I worked. I would found my purpose and my place in the world, and it wasn't defined by a job or societal expectations. I continued to live simply and sustainably, 
growing my own food and living off the land. I even started a small business, selling my produce and homemade goods at local markets and farmers markets. I had found a sense of community in my neighbours, my neighbours being horses, and I was content with my life. As the years went by, I couldn't help but wonder what had happened to my old colleagues and friends who were all stuck in the corporate world. I had let go of the need for material possessions and societal success, but had they? I couldn't help but feel a sense of sadness for them, trapped in a cycle of chasing after something that would never truly fulfil them. I realised that my journey had not only been about finding my own happiness, but also about showing others that there's another way to live, a way that is more fulfilling and meaningful. As I sat on my porch, watching the sunset over my land, I felt immense gratitude for the journey that had led me here. I'd felt like an outsider in the past, but now I knew that I had my true home and my true self and that was worth more than any job could ever offer me. It wasn't an easy journey to get here. I had to escape the system and its never-ending cycle of working and paying bills. I wanted to live a simpler life, one where I could be self-sufficient and not rely on anyone else. So, when I stumbled upon this property for sale, I knew it was my chance to break free. The previous owner had left behind a small greenhouse and some tools, and I quickly got to work planting all sorts of vegetables and herbs. It was hard work, but it was also incredibly fulfilling. I could see the fruits of my labour growing right in front of me, and it gave me a sense of purpose. But one day, while I was tending to my garden, I noticed something strange. There was a small door hidden under some bushes at the edge of my property. I had never noticed it before, and curiosity got the best of me. I opened the door, thinking that it was just a ripped off door, thrown away, or someone had just fly tipped it. But when I opened it, I found that it was rock solid, immersed into the earth itself, and down below it was a set of stairs leading into darkness. Without a second thought, I ran back to my house, grabbed a flashlight slash torch, and made my way down. As I descended, I could feel the air getting colder and mustier. And then, I finally reached the bottom and found myself in a series of underground tunnels. I cautiously walked through the tunnels, my heart racing with excitement and fear. I couldn't believe this was all under my property. As I explored further, I came across something that made me question my own life. A pile of bones. My mind was racing with questions. What bones were these? To me, they looked human. Who did these bones belong to? How did they end up here? And most importantly, what should I do about it? I knew I had to report this to the police, but a part of me was afraid of what they might find. What if they thought I had something to do with it? I couldn't just ignore it and go back to my normal life. I knew that I had to do the right thing, so I went to the police station and filed a report, telling them everything I had discovered. The police were skeptical at first, but when they sent teams out, I showed them the trap door and the tunnels. They knew I was telling the truth. They immediately launched an investigation and asked me to stay out of the tunnels and they could, could gather evidence. Days turned into weeks and the investigation seemed to be going nowhere. The police were no closer to finding out who the bones belonged to or how they ended up there. And then, one day, they called me back to the station with some shocking news. The bones belonged to two males, estimated to be around middle-aged, 40 to 60 years old. They had no further information and couldn't identify anything other than their gender. There were no links to the tunnels, 
and no one explained or understood why they were even there. According to the police, previous owners, or people who dwelled on the land illegally, had dug the tunnels. Judging by the tunnel's depth and how they were dug, they had been created using hand tools, which according to the investigator, would have taken up to seven months, seeing as one of the tunnels stretched over 200 meters in length under my land. Something was so scary and eerie about all this. If I'd never have known that, or never have even gone near that edge of my property, I wouldn't have seen the door, and then I wouldn't have seen the tunnels leading me to the skeletons. So, what are your thoughts? I have no idea what to think, and to be honest, I don't really want to think. This is more like a new land horror story, but I'll just keep it under this category, as new house, new land, same thing right? I built a house on the new land, so it's still a new house horror story. I would be buying a house in Madrid, Spain, but after years of saving and dreaming, I didn't have enough money. It took me all the way until I was single and 30-something years old to make that dream my own reality. I was ready to start a new chapter in my life, and what better place to do it than in my dream place of Madrid. After weeks of searching, I found a perfect house. It was an end of terrace house with a charming red brick interior and a small but cosy backyard. The interior was a mix of modern and traditional with high ceilings and beautiful tiled floors. I fell in love with it instantly and knew it was the one. The process of buying the house was smooth and before I knew it I was all moved in and settling into my new home. As I unpacked, I couldn't help but notice my neighbor's house next door. It was slightly run down and gave off an eerie vibe. When I went for the viewing of this house, I could have sworn that it didn't look like this. However, after traveling back to France, the house, of course, hadn't been viewed in over three months. I was thinking that I was just over-exaggerating, or perhaps just hadn't paid attention when I was doing the viewing. After all, who goes to a house viewing and pays attention to the neighbours next door? Well, according to my dad, that's what you're supposed to do. As the days went by, I started to hear strange noises coming from my neighbour's house at night. It sounded like whining at first, like a dog or cat was in distress. But then, I thought it was just my imagination. The cries continued every night without fail between the hours of 11pm and 2am. The cries were faint, but I could still hear them clear as day. Curiosity got the better of me, and one night I decided to investigate. I quietly made my way to my neighbour's house and pressed my ear against the wall. The cries were definitely coming from inside. I was torn between calling the police and confronting my neighbour personally, but I didn't want to jump to conclusions and cause any trouble. The next day, I tried to make small talk with my neighbour when I saw him outside, but he completely ignored me. He seemed like a strange and reclusive man, always keeping to himself and never interacting with anyone in the neighbourhood. I couldn't shake off the feeling that something was off about him. As the days went by, the cries for help continued, and I couldn't take it anymore. I decided to record them on my phone and take the evidence to the police. At first, they tried to say that I was tampering or fabricating false evidence as a way to get back to my neighbour but I eventually managed to convince them to at least listen longer 
and analyzed the evidence I'd brought forward. They were shocked and immediately launched an investigation. That night, as I lay in bed, I couldn't help but wonder about the mysterious cries of my neighbor. Suddenly, I heard loud noises and commotion coming from next door. I quickly grabbed my phone and recorded everything I could hear. The next morning, my neighbor's house was swarmed with police cars and officers. I nervously watched from my window as they raided his house, searching everything. A few hours later, the police came knocking on my door, asking me to come down to the station to give a statement. I was shocked when they told me that they had found in my neighbor's house a 19-year-old girl held captive in the basement. She had been missing for months, and no one had any idea where she was. I couldn't believe it. The cries for help I had been hearing were from her. As the news of my neighbor's arrest spread, the whole neighborhood was in shock. I couldn't believe I'd been living next to a criminal. I couldn't help but feel guilty for not taking action sooner. But I also couldn't help but feel relieved that the young girl was finally safe. A few weeks later, after the whole ordeal had settled down, I received a knock on my door. It was the girl who had been held captive. She was tearfully thanking me for taking action and potentially saving her life. She was there with her two parents. She thanked me for being her neighbor and listening to her cries for help. They came in and tried to offer me a massive cash reward, but I declined it. She explained that she had been backpacking through Europe when she was kidnapped by my neighbor. She had been kept in the basement and was too scared to make any more noises until she heard my neighbor's arrest and realized she had a chance to be rescued. That's what all the commotion was about the night before, the night before I saw the police outside his house. She realized she had a chance and started screaming as loud as she could. I was overwhelmed with emotions and couldn't believe this was all happening next to my new home. But I also couldn't help but feel proud of myself for taking action and potentially saving a life. As the months went by, the neighborhood slowly returned to its normal state. My neighbor's house was now empty and put up for sale after his family allegedly forced him to sell after he was sentenced to 15 years in prison, including parole. I couldn't help but feel a sense of sadness when I looked at it, but I also felt grateful for the new friends I had made in the neighborhood. We all came closer together to support the young girl and make her feel welcome. Buying a house in Madrid, Spain had turned out to be more eventful than I could have ever imagined, but it also made me realize the importance of being a good neighbor and looking out for one another. I never would have thought that a simple act of recording and reporting strange noises would lead to the rescue of a girl, an innocent backpacker. As for my new house, it will always hold a special place in my heart, even if the first month revealed me living next to a criminal. It may have some dark history, but it also represents a new beginning for me and the girl who was saved. From now on, I will always make sure to listen and take action if I ever hear cries for help again. It was a dream come true, me and my husband John. He told me that he had purchased a beautiful country house in Oregon. We had been living in the city for years and the thought of moving to the countryside with our two kids was exciting. 
John's consultancy firm was doing well, and he wanted us to have a peaceful and serene place to raise our family. I was a stay-at-home mum, and I couldn't wait to start a new chapter of our lives in our new home. As we drove down the long driveway to our new property, the house was a rustic farmhouse with a large wraparound porch and a big red barn in the distance. The surrounding land was filled with lush green fields and tall trees. It was perfect. We spent the first few weeks settling into our new home, unpacking boxes and exploring the area. The kids were thrilled to have a big backyard to run around in, and we even got a few chickens and a couple of goats. But, as the days went by, I started to notice some strange things happening around our land. It started with dead birds appearing on the ground. At first, I didn't think much of it, I figured they must have flown into a window, or something else, that knocked them out and killed them. But, then, we found a dead sheep in the field. We didn't have any sheep, but some of our neighbours did, and upon closer inspection, after contacting them, sure enough, they identified it as one of theirs. The sheep had strange bite marks and claw marks all over its body. I was worried and called John to come take a look. He reassured me that it was probably just a wild animal and that we shouldn't be too concerned. But, as the days went by, more and more dead animals started to show up. Cows, goats, and even a horse all with the same strange markings. We never found out what had caused their deaths, and it was starting to become really creepy. I started to become paranoid, and locked all the doors and windows every single night. I even stopped letting the kids play in the yard after dark, which they didn't take easily. I didn't want to take any chances. John, on the other hand, didn't seem too worried. He chalked it up to some sort of animal attacks and didn't want me to scare the kids. One night, while we were all asleep, I heard a strange noise coming from outside. It sounded like something was scratching at the back door or on the wall of our house. I woke John up and we both went to investigate. When we opened the door, there was nothing there, but when we looked down, we saw a dead rabbit with the same bite and claw marks. I was terrified and begged John to shut the door to let me lock it. Again, he brushed it off as a wild animal and told me not to worry. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to do. Yep, I didn't know what to do. I could repeat this line a million times, but everything started to feel like this place was cursed. What was killing these animals? Why were they doing it? Because whatever reason they were doing it for, wasn't for food. The animals would be left dead, their meat just lying on their bodies. I tried to talk to John about everything, but he refused. He kept on going on about it being an animal. But the point I couldn't understand was that an animal wouldn't just kill to not eat. What's the point in that, John? They save energy and only use energy when they need to eat or hunt. One night, I woke up to John walking around in the bedroom. I asked him what was wrong as it was around one o'clock in the morning. I knew that I wasn't imagining things. I had seen it with my own eyes. All of this, there was something seriously wrong. John, what's wrong? Um, never mind. But it's back again. He points out the window, and I get up off the bed. As I look out, sure enough, I can see a pile, like a pile of five or six birds all on top of each other. We didn't dare go out there again. 
Instead, we decided that we were going to go back to sleep, knowing that whatever that thing was, it wasn't going to come inside our house, was it? We woke up the next morning. John went out first to take a look, while I stood looking out the bedroom window, absolutely terrified. Once John came back in, he told me that the exact same thing had happened, from the bite mark puncture wounds to the claw slash of the top of the body. I didn't know what was doing this, and it made me want to leave our new house, no matter how beautiful it was, this was starting to creep me out. We hid a lot of this from the kids. Yes, that's right, we would bury the bodies at the back of the yard, but new ones would just keep reappearing. Eventually, John started to take this seriously, realizing that there's a possibility this could actually be humans trying to tell us something, whether it's some stupid witch or a warning sign. The truth was, John was starting to become worried, and I could tell. The first thing he started to do was to put up cameras on either end of the property. These cameras stretched as far as our eyes could see over both ends of the farm. The cameras also had night vision, which would allow anything to be in view, even on the most darkest of nights. We didn't see much, and for a whole week, no more animals were brought onto our land, as far as we were aware. John has a quad bike, he does patrols up and down the 20 acres that we bought, and for those 7 days, he found absolutely nothing. I started to relax a bit more, and dare I say it, I let my kids play for a couple hours after dark on that Friday. But, the next morning, on the Saturday, everything changed. When I woke up, and pulled back the curtains to a beautiful sunny day, Right in the middle of our farm was another dead cow, the meat untouched, the claw mark on the top of the body, and the bite marks on the throat, something that had killed the animal or drained its blood from taking it down from the jugular. Again, but this time we could look over the cameras, as I knew that John had put them up around a week prior. As we went downstairs, the first thing we both did was take a look at the cow, analysing that the exact same thing had happened. We now know for a fact that whatever was doing this was the same thing doing it over and over again. For example, if it's people, they're guilty for all of it. If it's an animal, a bear, some type of wolf or wild dog, then it's also responsible for all of the animals. No two animals would be able to mimic the same bite marks and claw slash. It was almost like they were trying to communicate with us. The scariest part of this all was that as we turned round after seeing the cow and trying to plan how to hide it from our kids yet again, John realised something. We were walking back and I had my head down, looking at the grass, trying to make sure to not step in any poop. I realised that John was stood frozen, just staring towards the house. I turned around and looked at him, and immediately I could see that something was wrong. He looked concerned and worried, his eyes were wide and his jaw was slightly open. John wasn't a mouth breather, he never broke through his mouth. As I asked him what was wrong, he just pointed, pointed to the corner of the property. That's when I asked him, John, you're gonna have to tell me, what is it? Sally, it's the cameras. They're gone. I turn around, as if he's joking, waiting to laugh. But they're actually gone. As I cast my eyes on the mounts, I can still see the frame and the wiring looms running from the top of the mount, down through the window and into our systems inside the house but the camera itself had been ripped off the mount, and was just missing. We never knew who did this, we sold the property, and never went back there ever again. We made a loss of $200,000, but I'd rather make a loss of money than a loss of one of our lives.
Who or what was it? I'll never know. But something tells me it was humans trying to send us a message or trying to scare us to leave. You got your way. Please leave us alone. It was a beautiful summer's day when I first laid eyes on the small, run-down house that would soon become my new home. I'd been searching for months for the perfect place to call my own, but eventually, everything seemed to be out of my budget. That was until I stumbled upon an auction for the cheapest house in town. I was hesitant at first thinking that there must be some sort of a catch. But, after doing some research and attending a few auctions, I soon realised that this was a legitimate opportunity. The auction house was located in a small town just outside of the city. I remember going there, the morning. It's so clear in my mind. The memory was so special to me, and meant everything. As I took my seat among the other bidders, I couldn't help but wonder who my competition was going to be. The auctioneer began the bidding, and I quickly realised that I was up against a few seasoned investors. But, I was determined to win this house, and I had my secret weapon with me, my boyfriend, Jake. Jake and I had been together for three years, and he had been my rock throughout this whole house hunting process. He was always there to support and encourage me, and I couldn't imagine going through this without him by my side. As the bidding continued, I could see the determination in the eyes as we went back and forth with the other bidders. After what felt like twenty odd minutes, the auctioneer finally declared us the winners. I couldn't believe it. We had won the house. It was a mixture of excitement, but also mystery, as we made our way to the front to do all the necessary paperwork. We had two weeks until we could officially move in, and those two weeks were filled with packing, organising, and planning for our new life and our new home. But, as I started to clean and prepare the house for our move, I noticed a strange smell coming from one of the walls. Upon further inspection, I discovered an awful overgrowth of mould on the wall insulation. I immediately panicked, knowing that this was going to be a big problem. I started to clean it off, not realising the potential danger I was putting myself in. I had forgotten to wear a mask and gloves, and I was cleaning. I started to feel lightheaded, and my face began to swell. I knew I was having an allergic reaction to the mould. I tried to push through and finish cleaning, but it became too much for me to handle. I couldn't breathe properly, and Jake could see how badly my face had swollen up. He quickly decided to call an ambulance and within minutes, all I remember was being rushed to hospital. I felt scared and helpless as I lay there in the hospital bed, hooked up to machines and monitors. I had never had allergic reaction before, and the thought of not being able to breathe properly was terrifying. But through it all, Jake was there by my side, holding my hand and reassuring me that everything was going to be okay. The nurse who took care of me, her name was Sandra, an angel in disguise. She was kind, patient, and always had a smile on her face. She took the time to explain everything that was happening, and she made me feel at ease. 
even though I was in a vulnerable state, she treated me with the utmost care and respect. I ended up staying in hospital for two days, as the doctors wanted to make sure that the allergic reaction didn't have any lasting effects. During that time, Sandra became more than just my nurse. She became a friend. We talked about our lives, our dreams, and our fears. She even brought me my favourite snacks and magazines to help pass the time. As I lay in the hospital bed, I felt like this was all just an ironic situation. I had won the cheapest house in town, but it ended up costing me so much more than I could have ever imagined. In that moment, I knew that it was all worth it. I would found a new home, and a new friend in Sandra. When I was finally discharged from hospital, I couldn't wait to get back to the house and finish cleaning. But this time, in all capitals, I made sure to wear a mask and gloves. Jake and I worked tirelessly to remove all the mould and make the house safer for us to live in. Despite the setback, we were able to move into our new home and make it ours. It wasn't perfect, but it was ours, and that's all that mattered. As I look around at the familiar boxes and furniture, I couldn't help but think that this was where our new journey as homeowners began. Looking back, I realised that sometimes the cheapest option may come with unexpected challenges slash curses, but it's how we handle those challenges that truly define us. I was grateful for the experience because it taught me to always be prepared and to never take anything for granted. And, as I sat on the front porch of my new home, watching the sunset with Jake by my side, I couldn't help but feel contentment and happiness. This was our new home, and it was perfect in its imperfections. And as for Sandra, she became a regular visitor, bringing us baked cookies, checking in on us from time to time, and taking me out on runs so I could lose a little weight. She'd become more than just a nurse, she'd become a part of our new family in our new home. Moving into a new house is supposed to be an exciting adventure, full of new beginnings and possibilities, but for me, it turned into a nightmare that I couldn't wake up from. It all started when my husband and I decided to move from our small apartment in the city to a bigger house in the suburbs of Ontario. We were tired of the noise and pollution of the city and wanted a fresh start. We found the perfect house, a two-story home with a backyard within a quiet neighbourhood. It seemed like your ideal place for the average working class family. However, our dreams quickly turned into a nightmare when our new neighbours came over to welcome us. As we were chatting and getting to know each other, one of them casually mentioned that the previous owner of the house had passed away. My heart sank at the news, but I tried to not think about it too much. After all, people die all the time, and it didn't necessarily mean anything sinister about the house. Me and my husband were kind of confused why the neighbour brought that up, but as the days went by, I just kept remembering what they said. For some reason, an enjoyful event of purchasing a new house now turned into this weird, creepy, and paranoid event activity. Every creak, every strange noise, and every flicker of light made me jump. My husband tried to reassure me that it was just my imagination, 
but I knew that something wasn't right about this house. Whether it was the house or my mind, at that point, I couldn't tell. One day, I decided to bring it up again with my neighbours. I asked about the previous owner. My husband looked like he was biding his tongue and hated the fact I brought it up. They told me about the owner, saying that she had lived there for over 30 years and had passed away peacefully in her sleep. They also mentioned that she was a lovely woman, always kind and welcoming to everyone in the neighbourhood. I felt a bit relieved at the news. I decided to do some research. What I found shocked me. After asking a few more neighbours, I found out that the lady who lived in the house before us was nuts. She had no family or friends and had been convicted multiple times. She rarely left the house and the only time she did interact with people was when she went grocery shopping. There were even rumours that she was a hoarder and that her house was filled with junk. All of this information only added fuel to my already growing anxiety. I couldn't help but wonder if this lady's death was natural, or if there was something at play. I started to become obsessed with the idea of deep cleaning the house. I needed to get rid of any trace of the old owner, and make the house my own. My husband thought I was overreacting, but I couldn't help it. I felt like I needed to do this to feel safe and comfortable in our new home. I spent the next few months scrubbing, dusting, and organizing every corner of the house. I even hired a professional cleaning service to help me with the task. I wanted to make sure that every inch of the house was spotless. I didn't want to take any chances. But... Even after all the cleaning and organising, I still just didn't feel right in this house. It was like the house was haunted by the memories of its previous owner. I couldn't bring myself to sleep in the main bedroom, knowing that that was where the lady used to sleep. I avoided using her old kitchen utensils, and we cleared everything out as part of the deep clean. My husband started to get worried about me and my behaviour. He suggested that we talk to a therapist to help me deal with my anxiety. Eventually I agreed. The therapist helped me understand that my fear was irrational and that I needed to let go of my obsession with the previous owner's death. It took a lot of effort and therapy sessions, but eventually I was able to let go of my fear and anxiety. I started to feel more comfortable in the house, and even started to appreciate its charm and beauty. My husband and I finally felt like our trolley home was there. It's been almost a year since we moved into our new house, and I can confidently say that I have moved on from the fear and unease that plagued me in the beginning. I've come to realise that the house is just a house, and its past doesn't define its present or future. I still occasionally think about the lady and wonder what her life was like, but I no longer feel icky or scared about living in the same house where she passed away. Instead, I feel grateful for the opportunity to make this house our home and create our own memories. Moving into this house with a roller coaster of emotions, but I wouldn't want to change a thing. It taught me to let go of my fears and live in the present, and now I can truly say that I'm happy in our new home in Ontario. there is a subreddit for embarrassment stories, I think I would post this there. But for whatever reason, I can't seem to find it. 
Can anyone help me? Question mark. Link down below to the page. But for the time being, I'll prop this right here, and some of you may enjoy it. Firstly, I wanted to bring up my neighbour. Nathan is a guy in his 40s who lives alone ever since his wife divorced him three years ago. I live with my sister, Charlotte. I've lived with her for around the past half a decade in this shared house. We both split the rent, and we're doing just fine. I liked the idea of living with Charlotte until I found a husband or a boyfriend to live with. I didn't want to live alone, and I think most girls reading this will also agree and relate to why. 1. Security 2. Loneliness 3. Fear of something bad happening and not having someone in the house to help I could list off another 10 reasons, but I don't want to drag on. The story needs to begin, so here goes. When we met the neighbour, it was no biggie. He said hi, and at the time we met his wife as well. When Nathan got divorced by his wife, she didn't really take anything. Well, nothing we could actually see. Maybe she took half his bank balance. But he wasn't particularly rich, as he lived in the same neighbourhood as us, and although he probably owned the house, it wasn't great. What happened to us wasn't anything related to him killing us, him chasing or stalking us, or him just being a creep. Well, I guess you could say it was creepy, but it was more embarrassing over everything. It was so embarrassing that Nathan upped and moved from that place he lived for the past years. Years, all capitals. Honestly, I don't know why he was doing this and what made him think he could just get away with something so stupid as this. Me and Charlotte were out in the road one day. Our little cousin had come over and we were teaching her how to ride her bike. She was cycling up and down with the help of stabilizers until eventually, me and Charlotte decided to take the stabilizers off. Once we took them off, we made sure she had her helmet, knee pads, shin pads, elbow pads, every pad which way, and off she went. First we started by guiding her down the road, a little past our neighbour's house and on further towards Nathan's. It's important to note, Nathan lives three houses down. We still class him as a neighbour, obviously. However, he is not our direct neighbour. Whilst we were pushing our cousin on the bike, she was having a great time, laughing, but also screaming and crying with fear, but I class that as a great time, because it's gonna be a core memory. We make our way down to being almost level with Nathan's house. Me and Charlotte look up. I don't know why, but almost in a synchronistic moment, we both look at the exact same time, and Nathan stood in his living room with the blinds wide open, but naked. The second he sees us staring at him, his hands quickly move to cover up his you-know-what, close brackets, and then he runs, diving to the floor, or so that's how it seemed. After this, we just see the blinds closing, as if by themselves, he must have been lying on the floor and reaching up with his arm on one side of the window. After this encounter, we never ever saw Nathan again. guys thank you for staying till the end of tonight's video you guys know the usual routine please leave a like if you haven't already please subscribe if this is your first time here and also comment down below any support any reactions or criticisms or opinions you have on any of the stories or anything that happened in the stories and lastly 
please share the videos with your friends, family, um, your neighbor named Nathan. No, I'm only joking. <laughs> but yeah, please share the videos with your friends, family, and um, it would mean a lot to me if you guys could help me grow this channel because I put a lot of work into these videos and uh, if you notice I upload every single night always brand new stories to bring you guys and um, yeah I'm trying really hard to grow my channel and with the support of you guys liking subscribing commenting and sharing it is possible and it is happening very slowly believe it or not against all of these automation AI channels I am actually starting to do well I think I'm defying all the odds I'm defying the laws of physics right now actually competing against channels run by billionaires who are using AI systems uh, it's unbelievable I mean it really is unbelievable how some of you are still choosing to support me and somehow the algorithm is still slightly promoting me in some areas of YouTube now I have had a lot of comments and messages and emails of people saying they've been unsubscribed from my channel or they just don't ever see my videos but they are still subscribed so they only ever watch the videos when they remember ah Slesla and then they go look it up and they have to manually do it if this is an issue you're having then please make sure you click the bell which is a silver icon next to the red subscribe button if you've done that and you still don't get recommended my videos then it may be an issue and I can't really help you there because you'll just have to write down a reminder <laughs> to watch Slesla tonight unfortunately that's how YouTube is nowadays it has many errors many glitches many problems and uh, usually going to the helpline may not help with this issue or it may but all you need to do is write a reminder because I will try my best for you guys to get a video out every single night thank you tonight was new house horror stories and if you have any recommendations feel free to comment down below but uh, yes I'll catch you guys in tomorrow's video see you then